This video series is going to show you how I go about building a 17th century joined chest with a drawer like this one. Uh, this is not one I built, it is partly an original. All this dark wood uh, is the original carcass of this chest circa 1670 to 1700. And then I replaced the lid and the drawer and uh, the floor inside and stuff. Um, I'll look at how I go about building this all the way from the log to the finished piece. This particular chest was made in Braintree, Massachusetts and uh, it's important to me because the very first group of chests I ever studied were these and did that work with Jenny Alexander and we ended up publishing an article in 1996 in the journal American Furniture about these chests. At that time we'd seen maybe 10 or 12 all by the same makers, William Savile and his son John Savile, uh, and his youngest son uh, also William Savile. I'll uh, give you more details on those men later. This one we think is the younger William Savile. He finished his apprenticeship with his older brother John. They all have four panels in the front and a single long drawer uh, below. Uh, this one is entirely oak here and then the inside the floor is pine and the back panel is pine. Um, so I'll just show you all the steps in making those and include some of the history of them as we go. Uh, I can't open this one. This the room is too small to do it for the camera and it's chock full of stuff so you wouldn't see uh, the construction inside. Anyway, I'll do that with still photographs. But I can show you from the, um, from the outside, you see the four panels across the front. We'll look at how the end of it is framed and then uh, start to study all of the details. The ends of the chest all follow the same format when the Savills built the chest with a drawer. The upright styles, the two corner posts, top rail and floor rail. The chest compartment is um, sealed up with two vertical panels and a center mountain. And then the drawer section is sealed by a horizontal panel and then below that a bottom rail. So all of these are mortise and tenon joints and uh, grooved on their inside edges with beveled panels. So frame and panel, mortise and tenon. Two pins in every joint except that one that gets a single pin. And always a molding on the top and floor rail and muntin. And on half of the chests a molding on the bottom rail the other half leave that rail blank and uh, that's part of how we distinguish between the work of the older brother John and the younger brother William but that becomes sort of furniture scholarship minutiae. Uh, but mortise and tenon frame and panel construction. I'm using this chopstick when we look at the details of the carving just because my hand was throwing the light meter off uh, between the dark finish on the oak and my hand. Um, so here's the lunette on the top rail. This is on this chest there's five of them. On uh, some of the chests there are six of them. Here, right there, is the center point for the compass that he used to lay out these arcs. And the arcs are one, two, three, four, five at least. I don't think there's a sixth one in here. And uh, then a vertical center line imagined here. I don't see it. Uh, maybe there's a hint of it right there. And certainly helpful to have one. And then a diagonal line from that center point right through there and it comes all the way out to out here 
and that is where you then carve this shape the point of this tulip shape hits that diagonal line here and there and but that's maybe getting ahead of ourselves it's all v tool work and again no background like i was saying but shaping around that v tool work so this hollow here around the lunette is done with a narrow shallow gouge alexander used to call this the marble run and one thing you notice about this the savils weren't the only people who carved this sort of detail but they're the only ones we know in new england certainly who broke it at the top that hollow stops here and then starts up there again every time now my theory is that's because when the lid is in its proper place you don't see that anyway there's a shadow under there my lid is not attached so i can shove it out of the way uh alexander used to say it was to let the evil spirits out and that's why it was broken there and stuff we don't know why they did it we just know they always did it and then v tool work to define the tulip shapes here uh, and then shaping that it isn't flat it's sort of beveled down to the depth of those v tool lines and decorated with a very narrow gouge and it gets to be really uh, tremendous detail but the top and bottom usually the second and fifth of a batch of six of these are cut like that this batch it looks like it's the top and the bottom one with some in between um, punches with the cross the Maltese cross I'll show you how to make that punch so the only background is really relieved behind here behind there so forth and then various details around there and we'll look at how the panel relates to it I've switched to a still photograph to look at the details of one of the panels from a related chest. And uh, when I get to the carving, I'll give you all the details. But here, I just want to show you uh, how it's composed and how it's sort of decorated. It's clearly related to the lunette in that uh, you see the V-tool work for all of the outlining and in the arch itself in the main proper arch uh, instead of alexander's marble run which is a concavity this is a convexity so he outlines it with the v-tool and then bevels down to the depth of that cut to create that convex surface on the arch that's then decorated with uh, sort of trios of these gouge chopped inverted V's or seagulls and you see that every third one is uh, got a chip behind it for more shadow and then the other two accent it and, and march all up the arch to meet at the top center inside the arch is a hollow like in around the uh, lunette this one continues all the way around done with a narrower gouge and inside that it's also decorated with the Maltese cross and the inverted um, well the flip-flop some inverted some right side up right side down uh, little seagulls again whatever you call them and then the main infill of the arch is um, a sort of leafy shape those S curves are formed with a V tool and then a shallow narrow gouge beveling on each side of those to give uh, to give the depth to this carving and then all the accent uh, stuff is cut with the uh, same gouge that did the seagulls around the arch and such punctuated here and there with the Maltese cross uh, no blank surface again it's classic 17th century stuff and the spandrels the triangular areas outside the arch 
also uh, decorated just with light and heavier cuts of the gouge. So we'll go into a lot of detail of carving um, the panels and the lunettes and uh, the draw front which relates directly to the lunettes. The draw front you can see at, just at a glance uh, is really just a doubled up version of the top rails lunettes. Uh, same diagonal tulip shapes, same concave outline, broken north and south. Uh, the layout is distinctive to the drawer front. Uh, there's seven of these rosettes and then some alternating pinwheel motifs between them. And uh, we can look at that detail again later. But I just wanted you to see it's the same uh, same elements, same treatment on a much different scale. This is six inches high for the doubled up uh, lunette. So uh, compared to a four inch high for that half circle. Uh, but anyway, that's the same sort of thing. And that's what you always see across the drawer fronts. The 20th century lid that came with this chest was two large square panels and a dividing muntin between them, uh, which was silly. The chests from the group that have their original lids uh, indicate that often these joiners used chestnut for their lids. They'd build the chest out of oak. The floor of it would be white pine or sometimes white cedar, and then the lid would be chestnut. And chestnut is, in America, uh, most of you know, uh, it's essentially gone. The trees have suffered a blight since the early 20th century. And um, now you can get it as reclaimed boards. Uh, what I have done here is made a lid out of white oak. So four boards varying in width from about four to six inches or so, uh, split and planed and edge joined together, and then a thumbnail molding around uh, the perimeter and a cleat underneath secured with handmade nails attaching that uh, cleat to help keep the lid flat, keep the boards together. What I'll do in the video is just this. I'll make uh, an oak lid, only this time I'll use quarter sawn boards for those lids. I just don't have a tree big enough to get these wide and long boards like that. I have some, but I'm using them for the drawer. And, um, and it's just not terribly practical. But quarter sawn boards will mimic this uh, quite nicely if you select them carefully. This interior view shows you three things I want to point out. The lidded till on the proper right end there with the oak lid, the oak side as well, um, about five inches wide, about three inches deep. And down below is the floor or the bottom of the chest. These are uh, short boards running front to back. They fit in grooves in the front and side rails and sit on top of a lower rear rail and are themselves tongue and grooved to each other and then nailed down to that lower rear rail. The back panel is a large horizontal pine panel uh, in this oak chest, and that's a distinctive feature of these uh, Braintree chests or Savile chests. Uh, most other New England chests will have frame and panel just like the front of the chest, and here they do it uh, a pretty distinctive manner. So we'll look at all of those details when we come to it. And just in that top rail you can also see uh, the tails of the iron hinge uh, that's part of a pair of hinges for attaching the lid to this chest uh, and that will be part of our project as well. So I don't know how long the video series will be. I'll 
go into as much detail as I can. There's a lot of repetition, of course. I won't show you how to cut 45 mortise and tenon joints, but uh, we'll certainly look at all the pertinent details along the way. Having had the introduction to the chest, now I want to turn my attention to looking a little bit at the materials. Um, as discussed, when we looked at the chest, the primary wood, the, the main structure, is oak. And the secondary wood, uh, the floor, drawer bottoms back, those are either white pine in the originals and will be white pine in mine. Uh, some of the originals look like they have Atlantic white cedar for the floorboards and drawer bottoms. But anyways, uh, soft wood for the secondary wood and a hard wood for the primary. Uh, one of the first questions I got when I announced this series is, are you going to show us and talk about uh, what you can build this out of if you don't have a, a oak log? green wood to work with and uh, I will certainly touch on that and illustrate some of it here. I have built some chests years ago in the late 1990s, built a flock of chests, maybe eight or ten of them, uh, from sawn oak uh, and some sawn elm um, and flat sawn and quarter sawn and every which way sawn. Uh, you can certainly do it. Uh, lots and lots of chests, uh, probably the majority of the joined chests uh, that I know uh, from England are done in sawn wood. Uh, but here in New England, the, the wood was um, split from a log, like this piece of red oak that I've got here. Well, that one's, <laughs> that one's a reject. This was the other half of that one, I think, and it is uh, better in quality. I mean, it's, these are 12 inches long, so, but that's the stock I use. Split it out, uh, and I'll go into that in great detail. So, yes, you can use sawn wood. No, it doesn't have to be oak. There are framed or joined chest, frame and panel chests uh, from Pennsylvania, early 18th century, that are all done in walnut. There's uh, ones from the same period in the southwestern, uh, what is now the southwestern U.S., New Mexico, uh, that are all done in pine, but frame and panel, mortise and tenon. Um, there is one I'll drop an illustration of one in here, uh, an English one I know done in ash, and a Massachusetts one done in maple, and uh, and I'm sure there's other ones besides. So the notion, the format, the frame and panel, the mortise and tenon, it's adaptable to all kinds of timbers. You don't have to have this oak. Uh, I'm going to show you how I use that oak because that's what I do. And um, then there's uh, <laughs> lots of other uh, detours in looking at the materials. There's uh, the, the whole green wood thing of splitting the log and, uh, and processing all of the pieces. And because of that, there's a lot of emphasis on the radial plane, the surface that is uh, perpendicular to the growth rings. I'll talk about that more in a minute. And the tangential plane, 90 degrees to that. In the sawn wood uh, approach, you have flat sawn, quarter sawn, rift sawn, and probably others that I uh, know little or nothing about. And, um, and those all come into play when you're working, a, building a chest. Um, one of the places I turn when I have questions about wood is this book, uh, Understanding Wood by Bruce Hudley. 
and that is the revised edition, which is now about 20 years old. But great detail in uh, the cellular structure of it, uh, the mechanics of it, how it behaves. Moisture and wood is one of the chapters in there. It's really uh, vital when you're working uh, the fresh stuff like I do. Uh, it's a great, great book. So I'll briefly look at this um, uh, this ribbon stock I've got here. Because we'll cover so much of this as, uh, as the work progresses, I'll just give you a brief rundown on the structure there in case uh, this is new to you. Um, woods like oak, ash, hickory, uh, sassafras, catalpa, elm, locust. These are called ring porous hardwoods. I'm sure there's others I'm forgetting. And uh, that term mainly refers to the way their uh, growth ring is structured. It has sort of two distinct uh, sections. One called the early wood, which or the spring wood is another term for it, and that's the porous part, of the, the fast growing part of the growth cycle and uh, characterized by very uh, large and in some cases hollow vessels. And then um, the late wood or summer wood that follows that is more dense. So each growth ring is very distinct and um, most one of the characteristics of the ring porous hardwoods with one exception I know of elm uh, they split very predictably and easily in two different planes in the radial plane running perpendicular to the growth rings and in the tangential plane running parallel to the growth rings. Um, it might show up here. There are bright lines running from the middle of the tree here up to the bark and those are the medullary rays and they're part of the structure inside the tree that transmits nutrients uh, this way through the tree rather than vertically. And um, they split very readily, and then the growth rings that way. I'll split this uh, right in the ray plane. And you can see that it just breaks. A straight piece of it will just crack right open like that. But it also splits very well in the growth ring plane or tangential plane. I didn't want to drive this into the bench, so another split there. Of course, in a three inch long piece, everything splits easily. But, uh, th so those are the two planes that will mostly be splitting the oak in. And, but some of this information is transferable to sawnwood too. Uh, the closest cut in sawn timber to this riven or split stock is quarter sawn wood. And the, uh, the industry has different, uh, uh, different definitions or different degrees. Uh, that they will consider something quarter sawn and generally what it refers to is a board that's been cut close to parallel to those medullary rays, close to perpendicular to the growth rings. Sometimes you'll get a board that's perfectly quarter sawn, sawn right on the radial plane. I found a piece of um, a wood I've been using lately that I had forgotten about. It would be excellent uh, if you had a lot of it. It's butternut, uh, which is uh, a relative of walnut. But I wanted to show you this one because this board is perfectly quarter sawn. 
the growth rings are running dead uh, perpendicular to the face of the board. So a very stable board. Uh, I'm not sure I touched on that, but the, f the prime benefit of quarters on stock is its stability. It stays flat in that dimension because there's very little shrinkage this way. The shrinkage is more in its thickness. Um, so that's a, a good illustration of something that's right on quarter sawn. This, uh, this one, the ray plane, the medullary rays, are running like that. And the growth rings cross there. This I would call quarter sawn. And it's a really nice piece of oak. It's white oak in this case. And it planes very nicely. So this would work very similar to the way my ribbon stock will work. With one distinction. Uh, we don't know how how well this tree grew in in the how straight did it grow and I have a chunk of that same log here and this one is what the trade would call rift sawn and I'll put a detail in of those growth rings and they're at a much more pronounced uh, the rays and the rings a much more pronounced angle uh, this one um, I looked at and thinking about how, how would using this building a chest, what do you have to watch out for? And one of the places you need to consider, I mean, planing it, you'll be able to plane it and get it flat and smooth. It's chopping mortises in it and cutting a groove with a plow plane in it that create a little bit of a uh, little bit of caution. You need to approach those a little bit differently. And the reason is the saw will cut this straight no matter how the tree grew. If you split it, it's going to split the way the tree grew. And this one, I took a marker here and highlighted the way it really grew. I split this chunk off. And you can see the growth ring here bends like that. So there's a lot of what we call run out of the fibers where this fiber is run, running from here and it's out of the board right here. So if you're planing in that direction you're going to be cutting into those fibers what you might know as cutting a, a, into the grain or across the grain. Um, and I ran a plow plane on this the other day and um, one of the things that will happen is you might have to chop a mortise in here and then run your grooves and your panels. And you can do it. That plow needs sharpening. But what you get is some tear out here where you're running into the fibers that way. Right here it was cutting fine, but because of the way the tree swept as it grew, you're cutting into those fibers. You just want to plan your work uh, accordingly, and one, one way to sidestep some of that tear out is to score where that groove is with a very sharp marking gauge first. Um, with my ribbon stock, you barely have to think about that because you're pretty much running in line with the fibers. That's the nature of how you split it. Here is some of that tear out. It's not fatal, but it's just a little more headache, a little more effort required in working that stuff. And the same is true. Uh, here I have a pretty extreme example. And this is a piece of walnut. And walnut is fine timber. You can make a really nice chest out of it. I never have. 
I have made some joined stools in walnut and in stock I split out. This was sawn. And it it has run out in a couple directions. So the fibers are running here and they come up out of the board at this and that's pretty close. Uh, but in this other direction they're really running right out from here to there. I don't know if that's showing up from here to there. Very quickly running right across the board. Right from here. So where that's going to really give you a hassle is when you have to chop your mortise. You take a, mark, a mortise gauge and scribe your lines and then I'm just making up this distance here. Now, I've marked out that mortise from here to there and about three-eighths of an inch wide. And the fibers right here go from the middle of the mortise's width right there to its edge and here like that. So what that means is when you're chopping this uh, the chunks won't come out in nice big satisfying heaps that you just pull out and stuff. You'll get ragged cuts in there. You'll need to sharpen more often and pry and pick at those a little more. You can chop them. I've done it in stock like this. Uh, but and I'll chop one when we get to mortises to show you what it's like and be able to compare it to chopping mortises in the riven stock. If this sort of material is what you've got don't let it don't throw up your hands and say oh I can't make a chest. As I said I've made them out of all kinds of stuff. This is a piece of um, going back to the ring porous hardwoods this is a piece of ash and I found it up in the loft. It was uh, part of uh, a project that got away. And, um, but you can see it's radially riven and planed just like the oak does. It works very much like oak. Uh, it doesn't have the visible medullary rays but it still splits in that radial plane perfectly. One of the distinctions about ash uh, is it's very, uh, very poor decay resistance, which doesn't matter for your furniture, but it matters for your log. So if you get a log and you're splitting it and you don't use it all, storing that log in chunks uh, doesn't work like you can store an oak log for a long long time a couple of years sometimes and the sapwood of the oak will rot but the heartwood will be fine the ash is mostly sapwood and it uh, it goes off it turns gray and mottled brown within a few months particularly in the summertime and um, so doesn't last long in the log so when I'm working ash, I try to work up the whole log into pieces very uh, promptly, within, say, two months. And um, it's doable. Uh, beautiful wood splits as straight as can be because it grows very straight. And um, really, really nice wood, perfectly strong, lighter weight than oak, and a lower moisture content. So a uh, little bit different to work. When you're planing it when it's dead green, it's sometimes a little stringy. And, um, and then I find I, I plane it, let it, leave it oversized, and then plane it again, and it cuts up nice and clean when it's drier. Um, now, and then here was a piece of um, maple. I, as I said, I didn't have flats on oak to show you but I have a flat sawn piece of maple. So here are the growth rings running this way. So the radial plane in this is its thin edge 
not its broad face. Just the opposite of the, the quarter sawn or radially riven stuff I use. Um, and you can use that, but you have to be more careful. You've got to get this drier than the oak I work with. Uh, because if you put your chest together while well, this still has moisture in it, it can cup this way and uh, wreak havoc on some of your joints and things. Another piece I always uh, focus on is, um, and it leads to a lot of confusion, so I'll try to uh, try to be really clear. Uh, these two pieces are oak. This one is white oak. This one is red oak. And they are, this is one of the styles for the chest I'm building. This is left over from the cupboard I built uh, last year. And uh, one grew very quickly and one grew very slowly. This, they're three and a quarter, three and a half inches wide. And you see the growth rings running across them. This one's all glued to keep it from cracking because it's pretty fresh still. But they're oriented that way. Uh, I haven't turned around here. Yeah, this was the bark side. That was the inside. So the growth rings are running horizontally here. The medullary rays running vertically. And um, so you can sit there with a... I need a magnifier to see some of them. Uh, count those growth rings. And what I came up with in the white oak, there were, I think, 20 growth rings, 18 to 20 growth rings in three and a quarter inches. And this one, over 50 growth rings in uh, three and a half inches. So much slower growing in the red oak than the white oak. And it isn't about one is red and one is white. It just has to do with where these particular trees grew. Uh, optimal conditions, a lot of light, good soil, uh, and so fast growing tree. This one uh, maybe was in a dense stand of wood, who knows. Um, and what does that do for the strength of them? Well, technically speaking, this faster growing one is stronger. In this chest, it doesn't really make a difference. You can use either one. The chest is um, really quite strong and very well braced with all of those mortise and tenon joints uh, sort of working in unison. So the strength is immaterial. Uh, but in a chair, uh, like the ladder back chairs I have made over the years uh, that I learned from Jenny Alexander, there it's critical or the Windsor chairs that uh, a lot of people make these days. There it's critical, you want the faster growing stuff. Uh, the reason I like the slower growing oak is it works more easily and it looks more like what I see in the old pieces. Um, I have made chests with fast growing oak before and the end result looks very stripy to me. And uh, because you're seeing such distinct wide bands of those growth rings, I can see growth rings here that are a uh, quarter inch wide. Whereas on this one, they're, the big ones are 16. And um, uh, so it's just a visual thing mainly. Uh, it is a little bit ease of working. This stuff is a little harder to work, but not enough to throw you off. Um, now, that's ring porous woods, that growth rate stuff. I have no experience with, nor do I know, how woods like maple or cherry, how their growth rate affects their strength. I would think it doesn't it factor into it, but don't quote me on that. Uh, that's out of my out of my league. I only know oak this way. Um, softwoods. Uh, it's just the opposite. The slower growing stuff in softwood is more dense than the faster growing stuff. 
so it can be very confusing. It isn't a um, it, it isn't a construct that you can apply across all these different timbers, uh, or that will turn around to to cause you trouble at some point. So uh, I don't want to uh, get people the notion, oh, slow growing oak is perfect. It's ideal for this carved joint work I do, period. And uh, I wouldn't go any further than that. Uh, but you can make the chest out of either one. One thing I want to talk about that I'll address more later is um, the issue of moisture content in green woodworking. And this wood is as wet as it can be. I dug it out of the snow to bring it in and just begin to plane it. I'm using a scrub plane there. And um, it cuts so easily when it's wet like that. And what you need to keep in mind though is how is it going to behave? Uh, there is some shrinkage in that radial plane, not a lot, and uh, but there's shrinkage in the tangential plane. When the fibers are saturated with water, they cut more easily. That's just uh, uh, the nature of the material. But they aren't going to give you the best surface finish. And what I used to do, Alexander and I used to chop mortises in it when it was really wet like that. And they're fuzzy and, and easily cut, but not cleanly cut. And over the years, I came to approach it by working the material twice. I'll plane it while it's green, leave it a little bit oversized. And, and I mark the date on them. You might have seen that on this one. Um, the end of it has the date on it. And then I come back in a month or two months or even longer uh, and finish planing it, bring it down to its final dimension, and then begin to chop mortises in it and carve it. One, uh, one measurable uh, problem I had working wood that was too green, I chopped the joints in a piece like this one and plowed the groove for the panels and the piece kept on shrinking and that groove shrunk, it got narrower and I couldn't fit a panel in it nor could I fit the plow plane in it to widen it again because the iron wouldn't go back in the groove that it had made. Uh, so I had to open that up with a chisel, a very slow and laborious thing, I scored it with a knife and paired it with a chisel. And so that's a good lesson to let it sit a while before you go doing the final work on the green wood. Uh, I always uh, now stress that my first uh, criteria in choosing the oak is I'm more interested in that radial plane that dead straight fibers than in a higher moisture content. If the stock has been sitting here in the shop for two years, but it still is that dead straight radial stuff, that's what I want. And I'll carve that, mortise that, do whatever. Uh, it, so it, it, you know, it's easy to get distracted by the notion of the green woodworking. And I'll go into that in a lot more detail as I open up the log and start making the pieces. And that's what the next video will be. So uh, I'm really happy to get this project underway and looking forward to uh, seeing people's reactions to it. If you have questions and comments, leave them here and I'll monitor this regularly and try to keep on top of it. And uh, you can also follow on the blog. There's stuff happening there, too. And um, so here goes nothing. <laughs>